I'm with Dr. Ganeshan Digne Raja, one of Sri Lanka's best known economists, a senior researcher at the UK's Overseas Development Institute, which is a well, well known think tank, and a member of the Sri Lankan Central Bank's Stakeholder Engagement Committee. And I'm here with him, here, right here in Colombo, in Sri Lanka, and we're going to talk about the India Sri Lanka relationship as well as the economic situation in Sri Lanka one year after the crisis hit this IU country. Dr. Digne, welcome to the print. Thank you very much, Jyoti. It's a pleasure to be with you. Um, my first question to you is about President Renu Vikramasinghe's visit to India um, a couple of weeks ago. And this came a year after your economic crisis here in Sri Lanka. What, what are your comments about the visit, considering that there's been a lot of talk about uh, connectivity now between the two countries? So the important takeaway from the visit was that it attempted to reset relations between India and Sri Lanka. And the reset was really in the economic domain, and it was about improving connectivity between India and Sri Lanka. This means it looked at an energy corridor which brought uh, renewable energy to Sri Lanka from Adani projects, investments of about a billion dollars, uh, both in uh, wind power in the Mana Basin, as well as also the West Container Terminal in Colombo port, uh, which uh, provides star shipment to India. And there was this important proposal to build also a transmission line with India and also eventually an oil pipeline to connect India. So energy connectivity was a big one. And there were probably in the background some underlying issues which have been there in the India-Sri Lanka relationship. On the fishermen's issue uh, with uh, poaching uh, uh, being right. discussed. But what, what's your take on how did Sri Lanka here receive uh, President Kamasinga's visit, considering that there's been so much talk about now connectivity between the two countries? I think most Sri Lankans probably view the visit positively. Uh, India was important in helping Sri Lanka last year by providing about $4 billion in foreign aid. And I think that's widely recognized. And India was really a very important first responder under its neighborhood first policy. And at the same time, you know, there is hope that this relationship will go from aid to trade and investment. So there'll be a much more economic dimension. And this visit to Rani Vikramasinghe was, I think, the first step in trying to do that. So I read some commentary in some of the Sri Lankan media, you know, which says that that via this economic engagement or greater economic engagement there is, there is an attempt by India to colonize Sri Lanka within course. Sri Lanka, you know, is an island nation and people tend to be very parochial. Um, and I think it's a few commentators perhaps who are very left oriented, very kind of uh, pro-China in some of their views. And you will get these kinds of views, but I don't think it represents the majority of Sri Lankans. I think the majority of Sri Lankans you know, see India as an opportunity. Uh, India is growing at some 6% per year, uh, and you have a very strong government uh, in uh, Prime Minister Modi, who is also chair of G20 this year. And, you know, Sri Lankans view India coming as a first responder, as an important step for Sri Lanka coming out of this crisis. So, so the fact that India came as a first responder, sent fuel, medicines, you know, aid, and, uh, and I believe about $4 billion worth of aid, did that help change the mindset? I think so overall, because you know Sri Lanka defaulted on its foreign debt in 2022 April, and that brought a crippling economic crisis for Sri Lanka. And we appealed to everyone to come and help us, uh, including China, who is a big uh, provider of loans for infrastructure projects. And uh, nobody came. So why did China come? China probably had several reasons why they didn't come. The first is. China itself was grappling with the COVID crisis and was very internally focused. Mm -hmm. Second, I think China didn't want it brand tarnished with the default of Sri Lanka. You know, there is the case of Zambia, which China has been uh, involved in and also had to provide a bailout. China was reluctant to provide a bailout to Sri Lanka. China is very commercially focused. And I have a sense that China looks at success cases and wanted to have a success case in Sri Lanka and was probably very disappointed in what it saw in Sri Lanka with the debt default and uh, the issues that came after that. So do you want a member of the, Sri Lanka is a member of the Belt and Road, of China's Belt and Road? It's on the Belt and Road, um, particularly in terms of its ports. And, uh, you know, these projects uh, provided some benefits, but there were also some costs. Mm -hmm. uh, the benefits really 
uh, I, the form of Kalamba port, uh, which has uh, very impressive development, provides quite a bit of transshipment between, uh, you know, the, the big ships come here, they unload their goods, and then they are taken to India on smaller ships, and that's very important for both India and Sri Lanka. The, the downside has been, you know, the investments in the Hamantota port, uh, which in effect uh, were a very long-term project. The downside for whom? The downside really for Sri Lanka, I think, uh, because um, on balance, when you look at the Hamantota port, it's possible that the justification was made on the grounds of these uh, sea lanes uh, being uh, close to Sri Lanka, the main east-west sea lane which connects China with Europe. Right. Um, but the situation of a port there was probably a very long-term project. Uh -huh. And it was built, however, to us as a panacea for all our development problems after the war. Um, and that hasn't quite materialized. But there was no infrastructure there, there was hardly any uh, skills. Uh, it had to be created from scratch, and probably the timeline that was required is a 25-year project. Okay. Uh, but Sri Lanka somehow uh, was, I think, taken in in some way uh, by this panacea offered by development. Um, but it really will take a long time for it to come on stream. When it does, eventually it will bring capacity to Sri Lanka's ports. Um, but it's really uh, in that view that you see the Adani investment in the West Coast Terminal, which makes a lot more sense to me, right. uh, because the infrastructure is already there, mm -hmm. and the skills in and around Colombo, and it's a functioning port. And uh, we are seeing, you know, naturally a, a, a positive reaction to that. You are seeing a positive reaction to the Adani investment in Sri Lanka? I think so, because the port is coming up quite fast. We expect that port to be functioning um, in 2025, 2026, and because the existing infrastructure is already in Kalamba port, we'll start supplying rather fast. Whereas Namantote is a much, much longer term prospect for Sri Lanka. What do you make of, um, of reports that India and Sri Lanka will be jointly developing the Trincomalee harbour and the, and the port net? As a development banker, that's where one would have considered probably um, putting a port. Trincomalee is, is one of the largest natural harbors in Sri Lanka. Uh, it is a lot closer to India uh, and the transshipment trade that Sri Lanka would naturally provide to its large neighbor uh, than necessarily the port. Right? Okay. And but Trinco, Trinco rather than Colombo or both? Um, Colombo anyway was already existing right? Right. and the infrastructure was in Colombo and then naturally that will uh, feed into the transshipment. Uh, Trincomalee's big advantage is the natural harbor side. It has a very deep water port uh, and it had some 40 coves of which only three are developed uh, and, it, and that natural harbour site provides many advantages for potential development um, and that, that's why there was a British base during the war that the oil tanks are also there. Right. Um, it's a very poor region um, and also requires infrastructure investment but the natural advantages probably outweigh that of Hambantota. You know, a rock had to be blasted in Hambantota, the whole infrastructure had to be recreated. So Trincomalee makes a lot of sense and it's much, much closer to India, which, which is really the sign of the traffic flows. Um, so that existing traffic flows and the natural advantages of Trincomalee make it a very logical development, uh, but big investments will be required. It will probably require, uh, I, I would say, around $5 billion of investment to make it a viable proposition, both as a port, the hinterland, the oil tanks, and also the highways to connect Colombo and the hinterland around it uh, to uh, Trincomalee, which is a very underdeveloped region. So I want your sense, uh, Dr. Vignaraja, because if you remember about 35, 40 years ago when the Hiroshima Accord was signed in 1987, and there was a lot of talk about Trinco or Trincomalee at the time, also uh, India investing in it in the port at the National Harbor. That didn't happen. So 40 years later, what do you think has changed? What I think has changed is probably a realization in Sri Lanka in particular that um, you know, India has been an important first responder in foreign aid and has been a reliable partner. I think that's very important. But sadly, China, you know, is still... But that's only the recent crisis. Uh, that is correct. But also we have seen the Indian economy growing at 6% already, where Sri Lanka is in negative growth phase. Mm -hmm. So the two facts are both, um, you know, the, the economic crisis with India responding and the vast potential of Indian growth means that geography is terribly you know, a country like Sri Lanka, which is a small island of only 22 million people and in a crisis, cannot ignore the importance of geography and trade. And I think that's what has come about. Whereas in 87, India was not quite growing in the same way. And its potential, and also, of course, there's the Indo-Pacific strategy, uh, which the geostrategic side is showing that India is very much being 
uh, brought into the American and uh, Western uh, hemisphere uh, and the security concerns and so on. And I think that's the other thing that has changed. So I think these, all these developments uh, mean that uh, Sri Lanka is re-evaluating its relationships with India. Um, and I hope it will lead from an aid relationship, uh, which is a dependency relationship, to more a mutually beneficial trade and investment relationship. And I think that is where the long-term future of India and Sri Lanka lie uh, as partners going forward on trade and investment. So is India seen now here in Sri Lanka as part of a, a Western grouping, I'm not even using the word alliance, but you have the US, UK, uh, the French president was here, Macron was here recently. Is that how India is seen as versus China on the other hand? Well, India is being quoted by everybody, isn't it? Because it's fast growing uh, in the context of a world economy, by the way, that is also slowing. World economy is set to slow from 3.5% in 2022 to 3% this year. Uh, Asia is set to grow at 5.3%, and India is very much part of that, uh, set to grow at 6%. So naturally, it's being quoted. And uh, in terms of China's uh, factor costs are rising, but it needs labor. So a lot of industry is moving out of China to other regions. Uh, India has had Apple and uh, Mercedes, for instance, coming this year uh, and setting up plants and, and the supply chain aspect is very attractive. Uh, and I think Sri Lankan business is beginning to see that. So and government is beginning to follow that view. China uh, remains important because of the legacy of infrastructure projects. And I, I repeat to say that not all Chinese investment has been bad. I mean, Kalamu port investments uh, have right. been good. The highway between Karnataka and the uh, airport, uh, which also includes uh, the largest export processing zone in Colombo, has been good. And interestingly, the Norachore coal fire, fire plant, uh, power plant, has also been important because it provided a, a switch from hydro uh, to coal. Mm -hmm. um, but that was very important for Sri Lanka as it attempts to deal with urbanization and industrialization. So these projects have been very good. It's just that some of China's projects have uh, not provided the rates of returns uh, that one would have liked, uh, given you know, that these are lower projects. Okay, so if there is again talk after President Ekumasinghe's visit of, of these connectivity corridors, Anish Kodi to Tabai Manar, Kante Santurai, then the pipeline that you already talked about. Now, I would imagine that, that some people here uh, in Colombo, especially the Colombo elite, would think of uh, of you know of perhaps Sri, Sri Lanka becoming like an extension of say South India and that they would be resentful about. Well, if you look at the experience of ASEAN, um, trade and investment and infrastructure integration was really at the heart of its success, and this is right through East Asia. And South Asia suffers from being the least integrated region in the world. Interregional trade is probably 2% or 3% at best. Um, and it's, it's time that uh, you know, countries like Sri Lanka and India uh, lead South Asian integration. And I think that's going to be very important. Um, and this new partnership uh, could be very important uh, in setting a stone for the rest of South Asia. And you could see Bangladesh and Nepal and even the Maldives come into this sphere. Uh, now, of course, the important issues of small countries have to be taken into account in India. Um, India has to look into its asymmetry of its size of economy versus the others. Uh, that means having trade agreements that provide these asymmetric benefits. So small countries have some time to adjust. Uh, the investment side of these agreements are going to be very important. And also local purchasing of inputs from some of these smaller countries are going to be important. And also providing uh, access of uh, professional labor to the Indian market. The Indian market is going to be huge. It's going to need a lot of talent over the years. So India should do this integration in a much more uh, mutually beneficial sense. Otherwise, there will be a backlash. And that, that is what you're picking up. Yeah. Uh, that business people in Karamu and elsewhere, uh, be it in, in Dhaka or be it in Kathmandu, uh, will worry about if, if small industries wiped out uh, in the neighboring countries by large Indian firms that have economies of scale and other advantages versus the small enterprises. Uh, and, and that will not be good for regional integration in South Asia. So you think Sri Lankan neighbors should be very much part of Indian investment? A scenario possibly in the future? No, absolutely. I mean, it's it, look, when the Bangalore cluster of IT took place, um, you know, for various reasons, uh, Indian uh, investment and Indian uh, spillovers to a higher labor from Sri Lanka didn't occur, that went to the Philippines. And I think that's a great pity mm -hmm. um, because we missed an opportunity for South Asian integration under that scope. And I think India should be much more open to having professional labor. Uh, in IT, in uh, other areas that are re relevant uh, to Indian growth, 
Um, because India will be the magnet for investment in the future. And I think India actually will suffer labor shortages potentially of skilled labor and professional labor, and, and the regional countries can provide that. And that's what you have in Southeast Asia. Singapore has become a magnet uh, for labor throughout Southeast Asia. Uh, Tokyo is increasingly hoping to do this. Beijing is attracting a lot of foreign labor and investment, including skilled labor. And I think this is the way to go uh, across Asia. And India should be very much a part of that. Equally well, the smaller countries should recognize that Indian investment is going to be very important and Indian management and professional labor. You know, Indian uh, professionals and managers are there right throughout Southeast Asia managing some of the largest companies. And I think this is the inevitable part of integration economically across the region. So two questions, uh, Dr. Bhimaratu. The first is, why should India put good money into an Indian country when it should, when it can even in its own country, you know, especially parts of the north, so Bihar, Uttar Pradesh, are far poorer than Sri Lanka. The first reason I think is, you know, a vibrant, growing India uh, may not prosper so well if its neighbors are in crisis. And I think for security reasons, uh, India would benefit from having a neighborhood that's also doing well. And, and that's the lesson from East Asia. Um, you know, the countries in East Asia have grown by investing and connecting each other to trade and investment. And I think that's the important lesson of South Asia. So that's the first reason. The second reason is I think it makes good sense for Indian business to want to invest in its neighborhood. Um, and the Adani projects in Sri Lanka show that, right? So there is transshipment trade with India. Uh, there is potential energy trade and connectivity with India. Uh, and it's good for Indian business and good for Sri Lankan business. But to make that happen, Sri Lankan business also needs to invest in India. And the third reason, I think, is um, there is a humanitarian reason. Um, India has this global aspiration of being a United Nations uh, seat holder in the future. And to do that, if its own neighborhood is in crisis, how is India going to convince the world and the UN um, that it deserves a Security Council seat if it cannot act as a regional hegemon uh, with a humanitarian side as well? So I think there are three good reasons why India should play an important role in this neighborhood. Well, uh, that brings me to the fact that there hasn't been a SAF summit for nine years, the last one was in 2014. India has had huge, huge problems in Pakistan. Uh, Sri Lanka, of course, is a very good model uh, for the region. But uh, with the India-Pakistan relationship, does it bother countries like yours that this is sort of holding this region down? So South is in, you know, a, a, a stalemate, and you know that's because of the India-Pak uh, issues, and Pakistan is in major crisis. Um, I don't think the small countries and the rest of South Asia should wait for that India-Pakistan relationship to come right. Mm -hmm. uh, it is time that we look beyond SARC. And there can be variable geometry, if you like, in South Asian integration. So I think you could have a very interesting nexus between India, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, and the Maldives, and Nepal in that mix. And uh, that could really be very strong connectivity, centered on an open India uh, with trade and investment with its neighbors. Um, and when Pakistan is ready, um, you know, in Afghanistan, for instance, it could also join that mix. And that may take some time, uh, but I think the rest could serve as a model to come. And I don't think necessarily this means Bimstek. I mean, Bimstek would be very nice. Bimstek has its own challenges, but there could be an Indian nexus okay. uh, with the small countries in tow. And I think we should look at regionalism in a new way in South Asia. So when Pakistan is ready, so you're not going to wait for Pakistan? I, think, I think, don't think we should. Pakistan is in a very difficult crisis. Uh, I think far worse than our crisis. It's a much larger country that has a long legacy of problems. Um, and, and, you know, one can't even begin to unravel that problem easy. Sri Lanka is much worse. It's 22 million people. Uh, the economy is beginning to uh, come out of the dark days. Uh, so in the dark days, the Sri Lankan economy contracted at 7.8%. Inflation was up to 70%. Uh, foreign reserves were the day we defaulted at, at uh, some uh, 20 million in, in the bank. Today, the economy is still contracting, but inflation is down to about 12%. Foreign reserves are about a billion, that is usable reserves. Mm -hmm. um, and there is some sign of confidence, and these investments by Dani and others will help. And I think Sri Lanka is in a better place. So with a bit of money, um, Sri Lanka can turn around. And I think India should uh, really go big on Sri Lanka. And, and let me kind of explain what that should be. The 4 billion was much appreciated last year. And, mm -hmm. You know, that 4 billion was something like um, about 12 to 15 percent of India's outstanding aid budget at any one time, mm -hmm. right? Which was a very generous offer, the largest program India has ever given. I think, though, India should go very bold uh, and put some 20 to 25 billion in Sri Lanka over the next five years in collaboration with the IMF. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And the reason I say that is India alone cannot be expected to mount such a big sum of money. Um, but the IMF has the firepower to do that, uh, as well as other countries. Uh, so, so India backing backed by the, uh, by the IMF? In partnership with the IMF. Um, uh, one is that the IMF has very big pockets. Right? Mm -hmm. um, secondly, IMF has the supervision capability to make programs work in a country like Sri Lanka, make this economy uh, much more macro prudent, which is what the debt issue uh, would, would really require a solution of. Um, and also um, create a much more private sector oriented economy by dealing with uh, the parastatals that are uh, state owned enterprises that are loss making, uh, create a much more market oriented economy, uh, deal with the outsized public sector that needs a lot of reform. Um, and helping to eventually provide the skills uh, from the regional side that is also needed. But why should India do all this when there is when there continues to be some sort of similarity of resentment between the Tamil and the Sengura communities? I think this is a you know a problem that we uh, have had since independence. Unfortunately, it it, it uh, is lingering and has been very difficult. And Sri Lanka, uh, you know, needs to take a stronger view of how it deals with its minorities, not just Tamil but also the Muslims. Right. And I think, you know, an unstable Sri Lanka uh, with uh, divide and rule amongst, uh, you know, the majority and minority communities is not going to be a prosperous Sri Lanka. You know, we've had a 30-year conflict that has been extremely costly for Sri Lanka and probably lost 2% of growth and certainly at least $1,000 of per capita income. And I don't think this is sustainable. Sri Lanka is never going to get rich on the basis of ethnic divides. So we're going to need uh, to form a social compact. There is discussion, um, uh, the current government has initiated discussion. Now, of course, there are detractors. There are detractors who... But are you concerned? Well, I'm concerned in the sense that I think there needs to be recognition um, amongst the majority community, uh, the singular population in particular, that uh, divide and rule is not going to create a, a prosperous Sri Lanka. You think they are dividing and ruling? Historically, if you look at it, there has been that battle. Um, and I think we need to really have a much stronger uh, country with a former ethnic identity that is uh, really a Sri Lankan identity, uh, where all parties can live in peace and prosperity and do well. And I think that means uh, not only ensuring rights are there, those are there in the constitution, but we have to ensure that they are enforced in the courts. Uh, we have to ensure that there is peace uh, in the country. We have to also ensure regional development. Um, so the big issue in Sri Lanka really is this lopsided development model that we've had since independence where much of Sri Lanka's growth and prosperity has come from Colombo and Nampaha. That has to change. Uh, and the Trincomalee uh, Development Project, I think, is very important, is doing this, as is now that we have the infrastructure in Ahmadabad, we have to make the South Corridor also work. So I think all of this will be spread regions across the country, and devolution of power uh, is a very important aspect of some of this. So last couple of questions, uh, Dr. Vimaraja. You know, the Indians got their, got their hands burnt very badly in 1987 and the mid 80s with the whole Tamil insurgency issue early, I think, GFK, and you, you know that very well. Do you think India should be involved today in sort of supporting or backing this uh, potential reconciliation between the Singhala and the Tamil communities, or should it sort of lay its hands on? So I think India has already committed four billion dollars in tax money, and there's a billion odd dollars coming for Banani investments. This is a new trust. Never before has this happened. By the way, this 1.2 billion or so Banani money is equivalent to 67 percent of all Indian investment in Sri Lanka during the last 15 years. So this is a big change compared to the past, and the four billion of Indian aid is larger than any money that has been given to Sri Lanka historically. Right. So along with taxpayer and private sector money. Uh, needs to come to try to rebuild Sri Lanka. And I think that is the key point, right? Is that Sri Lanka, um, I think the former president, uh, Chandrika Kumaratunga, talked about Sri Lanka as a failed state. Mm. That is not the direction that Sri Lankans would want because the consequences of that on the majority community in Sri Lanka, as well as the minority, is terrible. We have already seen a million Sri Lankans who have migrated in the last year. And I think majority. In the last year? Yes, in the last year. There are a million passports that have been issued. So there's a lack of confidence among skilled professionals in Sri Lanka. Mm -hmm. So we really have to reinvent Sri Lanka for future generations if we want to have the kind of prosperity and to make Sri Lanka a viable state and go away from this risk of, uh, as Chandrika Kumar Tunga put it, President Chandrika Kumar Tunga, of, of a failed state. Um, and I think that really means rebuilding the economy in a much more market-oriented uh, state. We have to go away from the state-led model that has clearly failed. Uh, it has not generated growth, let alone um, any kind of poverty reduction. 
We also have to move towards a new social compact where all communities have a chance to prosper in this new Sri Lanka. But in this social compact that you talk about, the fact is that the 13th Amendment, which is part of your constitution, has never been implemented. And it doesn't seem to be that President uh, Kumasinghe is about to implement it either. Well, he's at least having talks on this subject, which was terrible in the past. And I think he has to try to bring the parties across the table. And I think the parties across the table, um, including those in the single community, have to understand that uh, you know, regional uh, devolution of power and of economic development is, is really the only way Sri Lanka can prosper. Because the lopsided development model we have has clearly had its limitations. So do, should India be involved more or should we just keep, keep away? So I think India has uh, basically taken the stand of putting money in Sri Lanka. Okay. And uh, you know, not just India but also China, also the, the Western countries uh, and the IMF. And, and governance reform lies at the heart of this. Right. Um, and you know, Sri Lanka is unique in Asia in having an IMF program with governance conditions. And uh, you know, that governance should, is now only being interpreted as anti-corruption um, and stronger public services uh, and a more market-oriented economy, the way I understand the IMF program. But um, others are arguing that governance should come in a broader sense, right? So last question, President Bikram Singh is going to China in October. Should India be concerned or apprehensive in any way about greater engagement between Colombo and Major. Inevitably, uh, those talks in China with President Vikram Singh and President Xi and the other Chinese officials are going to have to deal on the debt issue. Uh, we have a large amount of debt owed to China, although we're not in a Chinese debt trap in the way that uh, right. people in Delhi and others have talked about. Uh, but the debt is large to China, and China has to come to the table to help us restructure this debt. It's unsustainable at the moment. Okay. Um, that's one aspect of it. The second issue is going to be discussions around port calls, uh, which have uh, also uh, been at the forefront of India's concerns about its security, and Sri Lanka needs to talk to China about Indian concerns. Um, and I think that's going to be very important, and President Vikram Singh has at least articulated the fact that Sri Lanka will be neutral, and there will be a new standard operating procedure for port calls, which is the second uh, area. Uh, the third aspect of this is going to have to be the broader relationship between uh, Sri Lanka and its development partners in China by de facto uh, lender to Sri Lanka historically is also there. Mm -hmm. So I expect these issues to be there. And also the vexed question of Chinese investment in Sri Lanka. China has been very quick and very fast at providing loans at 6% to Sri Lanka, such as in the case of our mother report. But China has not invested here on a commercial basis properly, mm -hmm. except in the Colombo port city. So I think the conversation will be a very broad one with China. And one hopes that China will take a more positive view on Sri Lanka and come back both as an investor and also as a restructure of our debt. Dr. Kubirata, thank you so much for your time and for explaining all these issues so simply to an Indian audience. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be on print. This is Yogi Bhumutra for the print in Colombo.